Mark L was not Mark L anymore. He, he was controlling her. Basically, I need to pee from the ambulance now because um, I've killed four people. What have you done? I've murdered four people. I'd, ra I'd rather it be me than her. Yeah, she got a whole life ahead of her. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to manage without her. No. <laughs> Far too often, we see the most serious, violent crimes taking place as a result of failures by a system that is supposed to protect the public. Red flags that are missed or ignored. Violent criminals that are released due to good behavior or in an effort to show fairness towards the offender. But what the system so often fails to recognize is how releasing these offenders will affect the public. While I understand trying to be fair towards those in the criminal justice system, there needs to be a much higher emphasis placed on the victims, not the perpetrators. And if that was how the system worked, then these four innocent lives may not have been lost. But instead, a violent offender was released, red flags were ignored, and now an entire family is dead. But before we get into the case that will be sure to stress you out, I want to talk about a game that I like to play to relax. That game is Love and Pies. Love and Pies is the best game to play when I'm tired after a long day and I'm just looking for something relaxing yet engaging and fun while cozying up in my house after a long day of work. I also really like playing this game while I'm traveling or waiting at the airport to pass the time. Love and Pies is the cutest free-to-play Merge 2 mobile game that you can play on your phone or tablet. Ever since I started playing months ago, I can't get enough. In Love and Pies, your aim is to match fitting ingredients to create pies and other baked goods to then take them and serve to your eager customers. Then you earn tips along the way to finance all the upgrades and decorations you want for your cafe, which is one of my favorite parts of the game. I love getting to make design choices and building up my own cafe from the ground up. Plus, when you play, you will just be blown away by Love and Pie's stunning visuals and animations. They truly create an immersive experience that makes creating your own business that much more enjoyable. Now, Love and Pies wanted to do something special for viewers of this channel. Everyone that downloads Love and Pies using my unique link down below, then plays until day three, will receive an amazing free gift via the inbox message. You will get 200 energy and 50 gems. You will find out quickly how important those are to the game. Download now for free using the link in the description box below to get your super sweet surprise gift delivered to your inbox. Don't wait, download Love and Pies now, available on iOS and Android, and join me in some fun, relaxing gameplay. Thank you again so much to Love and Pies for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into today's case. This is the story of the Kilomarsh quadruple murders. 35-year-old Terry Harris was the mother of two children, then 13-year-old John Paul Bennett and 11-year-old Lacey Bennett. The father of Terry's children is Jason Bennett, with whom she was in a relationship for 14 years before they split up. We don't know the details of why they broke up, but by all accounts, it seemed that even after splitting up, the two maintained a relatively healthy relationship for the sake of their kids. Terry was described as a bubbling, outgoing person who would do anything for anyone. She was an amazing mother to her two children who were the absolute center of her life. She worked as a caretaker and was known to go above and beyond for everyone she cared for. She loved singing karaoke, going to concerts, shopping, and taking the children to see wrestling and dancing on ice. Lacey was described as theatrical. She loved dancing and performing, making TikTok videos, with her father referring to her as his TikTok queen. She was a girly girl who loved doing others' hair and makeup. She was very close with her brother John, and the two had a loving relationship, but that didn't mean she didn't love teasing him from time to time. Overall, she was known as being a loving, caring, generous person. John was known as being a lot more reserved than his sister. He was a real thinker and very thoughtful towards others. When he was little, he was very affectionate and always asked those around him if they were feeling okay. He was your typical teenager who loved playing video games on his gaming console, but he always made sure to spend as much time with his family as possible. By April of 2020, Terry started a relationship with 31-year-old Damien Bendel, who she met on a dating website. 
Damien was originally from Swindon in Wiltshire, but by September of 2020, he moved to Sheffield, South Yorkshire to be closer to Terry and continue their relationship. Those who knew Damien said that he could be known to be a proper gentleman, kind and sweet, when he was with the right partner. Friends of the couple said that they were happy together and they had a healthy relationship overall. However, as time went on, it started to become apparent that this seemingly healthy, stable relationship had a lot of issues going on behind closed doors. As the two continued dating, especially after Damien moved closer to Terry, Damien grew more and more jealous and controlling. After several months of being together, eventually Damien actually moved in with Terry and her two children. At this time, Terry's mom reports that she noticed a change in Terry. Now, when she first met Damien at the start of their relationship, she felt that Damien was charming and sweet. But by the time he moved in, Terry's whole personality changed. He was constantly by her side, never leaving her alone. She was a lot quieter than she ever had been before. Terry's mother also noticed that she changed the way she dressed. She used to be a tomboy, but after starting her relationship with Damien, all of a sudden she was always wearing tight shorts and low-cut tops. She also dyed her hair. It seemed like he was making her change her appearance or at least, you know, convincing her to so that Damien had some arm candy to parade around. That is at least what Terry's mother got from the situation. She seemed to watch everything she said around him. He was trying to stop her from coming to see us. Her friends were messaging me saying, we don't hear from her anymore. She doesn't speak to us anymore. My girl was not my girl anymore. He, he was controlling her. After moving in with Terry, neighbors also started noticing very heated, intense arguments breaking out between the two. In one instance, a neighbor was standing outside when they saw Damien storming out of the house, screaming at Terry, saying, this isn't finished, before leaving the property. The neighbor was so taken back by this argument because she felt that no one should be talking to their partner in that way. But despite the issues the two had, despite those closest to Terry noticing that their relationship was on the rocks, Terry tried her best to make it seem like things were going great. By August of 2021, after almost a year and a half of dating, Terry told a friend that she and Damien were actually trying for a baby. Then, around that same time, Terry told her mother that she was excited to marry Damien. However, by September of 2021, everyone around Terry would find out just how deeply disturbed and dangerous Damien truly was. The morning of Saturday, September 18th, 2021, started as a pretty normal day for the family. The previous night, Lacey's friend, 11-year-old Connie Gent, had spent the night, Friday night, at the home in Killamarsh. Then, on that Saturday, the two girls spent the afternoon outside the house setting up a little table to sell some sweet treats to help fundraise money for cancer research. As they did that, they recorded each other on their phones, making some goofy videos together, taking some fun pictures, and just overall having a good time together. They were happy-go-lucky. Now, Lacey and Connie were known to be good friends who loved hanging out and just being goofy together. Connie was described by her dad as his little sidekick who brought light and joy to everyone who met her. She just had this incredible talent to make anyone and everyone smile, no matter the situation or their mood. If someone was feeling down, she could instantly make them feel okay. She just had this gift to keep everyone smiling and happy. After spending the afternoon of the 18th selling their treats, Terry told the girls to come back home by around 8 p.m. By that point, Lacey and Connie had asked Terry if Connie could spend the night again for the second night in a row, and both she and Connie's parents agreed. So, the girls excitedly got themselves all ready for their sleepover. By that point in the evening, all three kids were now in the home with Terry and Damien. We don't know exactly when Damien got home, and I will tell you why that is in just a few minutes, but at some point, Damien did join the family and Connie in that home. Meanwhile, John had been texting his dad for a bit, talking about a Christmas present he wanted that December. Also that day, Terry had texted a friend saying that she needed to call soon because she had some good news for her. By 9 p.m., Terry told the girls to go brush their teeth, which they did. At that same time, Connie's mother sent her a text on WhatsApp to wish her a good night. Connie replied immediately after, telling her mother good night. 
As that was happening, Connie's mother also overheard her older daughter, Libby, talking on FaceTime with Lacey's older brother, John. The two had a conversation for about 30 minutes total. So it seemed like all of the siblings were friends with one another, and maybe the families were close, I'm not totally sure. After the FaceTime call ended at around 9.40 p.m., John texted his mother from inside the same house, telling her that he was going to take a shower. After that, it seemed that the house quieted down and everyone went to bed. However, by 7 a.m. the following morning on Sunday, September 19th, Dorset police had received a call from a woman who reported that her son told her that he was suffering from a self-inflicted stab wound. That woman was Damien Bendel's mother. Apparently, just before she called the police, Damien called her and told her that he had just stabbed himself. Immediately after this call to his mother, 999 received an emergency call from Connie Gent's phone. When they answered it, it was Damien on the other line who told the dispatcher that he needed an ambulance because he had just killed four people. Um, basically, I need the police in the ambulance and that because um, I've killed four people. Okay, just hold the line. Bear with me. Of course, officers immediately were dispatched to the scene, which was the home in Killamarsh where he lived with Terry and her two children. Officers went up to the door where they were met with Damien. Damien came out and spoke with the officers in a very calm and collected manner. He told officers that he didn't have a weapon on him at that time, but he had suffered multiple stab wounds. One to his chest, which was four inches in with a bread knife, and one wound to his stomach. He then took off his coat to show the officers his injuries. He also complained that he didn't want to go back to prison before calmly telling officers once again that he had just killed four people. The police body cam footage of this interaction has been released, and let me tell you, it is so eerie to see how calm and collected Damien is knowing he was admitting to murder. But let me tell you, once you find out what he really did to this family, the footage becomes even more shocking. Yeah, I, I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't know. Come, come, come to me. Uh, Mate, have you got yeah. anything on you that you shouldn't have? No, there's no weapons or nothing. Right, right do you just want to undo your coat? Have you, have, have, you, have you armed yourself? Yeah. You have? have. You, have, you got a, have you stabbed yourself, mate? I yeah. can see, see blood on your hands. Yeah. Anywhere else? Just my chest. Uh, four inches in with a, with a bread knife. Can we have a look? And, yeah, and one on the stomach. I bled yeah, quite a lot. Right, do you want to say it? Yes. Yeah. No, 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 just so stay there, stay there. Just I just don't want, want to be in front of her. Right, right, just around the corner. Just walking wounded at the minute. All right, stand here, stand here, stand here. Stay here. Right, so we're told you. I know what's going to happen to you now, mate. Well, I know what's going to happen we just go to prison, obviously, again. Why, what have you done? Have you done something to anyone else? Yeah. What have you done? I've murdered four people. After hearing this confession from Damien, one officer stayed outside with him while the other went inside to check the scene. And what they saw inside that home was absolutely horrifying. Damien went on an absolute rampage. Immediately when they walked into the home, they first found 13-year-old John's body lying on the floor in the main bathroom. As they made their way through the home, they then found 11-year-old Lacey and her mother, 35-year-old Terry, lying on the floor in the master bedroom. Then, in the second bedroom, they found 11-year-old Connie, who was also dead. As police discovered these bodies, it was clear that a violent, frenzied attack had taken place. They were all bloodied, and each had clear signs of severe head trauma. Obviously, the body cam footage of them finding the bodies hasn't been released, but a transcript has. When the first officer entered the home, he could be heard saying, Oh Jesus, there are at least three casualties. They are gone. They are all gone. Jesus, I don't know who they are, but they are all gone. Massive head injuries. Immediately, that officer went back outside to Damien and the other officer who then arrested him on suspicion of murder. Damien, it's 0747 hours. I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. Do not mention when questioned something like relying on in court. And if you do say it may be given in evidence, your arrest is necessary to protect you from harm, to prevent your disappearance, for a prompt and effective investigation. Okay? We're going to get you out, we're going to put you in the back of the van. Stand up. At this point, it is very clear what has happened. Terry, John, Lacey, and Connie are all dead after suffering from a brutal attack carried out by Damien. 
That is pretty clear here. However, at first, police had no idea why he would do something like this. It all seemed so sudden. They spoke to neighbors who said that they didn't hear anything from that night. They had heard Terry and Damien fighting on prior occasions, but that particular night, they heard nothing. No sounds of them arguing. No sounds of anybody who was being attacked fighting back. Nothing that told neighbors of what was really going on within that home. Of course, police started looking into Damien's past to see if they could make sense of all of this. And let me tell you, they found a lot. To say that Damien is not the man Terry thought he was is an understatement. And because of failure after failure by the system, Damien was allowed to come into not just Terry's life, but the lives of her children when he absolutely should not have been allowed to. Turns out, Damien Bendel has a criminal record that dates back decades. By 2004, then 13-year-old Damien had his first run-in with the law after he was charged with criminal damage after throwing an egg at a woman's house. Nothing too crazy. But then, he found himself getting involved in drugs, which resulted in several more run-ins. By 2010, 20-year-old 20 Damien received a warning for possession of cocaine. That following year, Damien committed a violent robbery against a man, which landed him a three-year jail sentence. He was out by that following year, though, being released on house detention to his mother's house. In 2015, Damien tried to rob a local news agent shop at Knife Point, but thankfully, the shop owner was able to fight him off. That landed him another three-year sentence in jail. I want to note that while being sentenced for this robbery, he admitted in court that he frequently stole money from family members and ex-partners to fund his drug use. So it seems that all of these other violent crimes were related to drug use. Keep that in mind as we go through the video. While in prison, he was not on his best behavior at all. On May 10th, 2016, he was charged with causing grievous bodily harm and assault after attacking two prison officers. In the meantime, as that was happening, an ex-girlfriend of Damien's called the prison to let them know of past domestic abuse she faced during her relationship with Damien, asking how to obtain a restraining order. She was worried that once he was released, he would come and harm her. A few weeks after that, another one of Damien's exes contacted the prison to say that more needed to be done this time to protect her and everyone else from Damien once he is released. I'm really not sure what happened with that. I don't know if she was ever granted that restraining order, but by December 20th, 2016, he was released and ordered to go to approved housing, but he never showed to that approved housing, so he was sent back to prison the following day. By January of 2017, he was then sentenced to 30 more months in prison for those attacks on the prison officers. He was then released in October of 2018, but he was sent back to prison once again for poor behavior at his approved housing. He was staying out all night, missing curfew, using alcohol on site, which was not allowed. Then finally, by August 9th, 2019, he was officially done with all of his sentences, so he was released from prison with no parole supervision. That meant that he wasn't actively being supervised on a regular basis, but he did still have to check in and report his activities to the parole board. Nothing is heard about Damien until March 17th, 2020, when Wiltshire police contacted the probation board asking about Damien's last known address because they had evidence that showed he posed a risk of sexual harm to girls. Despite a concern being raised, however, it doesn't seem that anything was done. This was about a month after Damien met Terry on a dating app and started a relationship with her. By May 9th, Damien is back in the court system after setting a BMW on fire while using weed and alcohol. This fire was deemed non-purposeful. It's not like he set the car on fire on purpose, but he did do it while in the commission of using drugs and alcohol. When determining sentencing for this crime, the probation board did a review on Damien to assess his risk level of harming others and reoffending. When making their determination, they did not read the report made about Damien posing a risk of sexual harm to girls, so this was not taken into consideration. 
In fact, they made absolutely no safeguarding checks, meaning they also did not look into those past claims of domestic violence. What they did know was that every single time he was released from prison, he did not stop committing crimes. When in prison, he was attacking people. When out, he was committing violent robberies and using drugs. They also knew that he openly admitted to stealing from family members and ex-partners to fund his drug habit. Those are facts that the parole board knew. Yet, when he was assessed at this time, he was deemed medium risk of causing serious harm to the public and low risk of causing harm to partners and children. Again, despite the report made of him being a risk of committing sexual harm against girls, despite the two women reporting domestic violence and one even trying to get a restraining order. After this determination was made in June of 2021, Damien was given a sentence of 17-month probation with 175 unpaid work hours, 20 days of rehabilitation activity, 6-month treatment for alcohol abuse, and a 5-month curfew. It was around this time that he wanted to move in with Terry and her children, and the courts found no issue with that, as long as he followed his curfew. The following month, another risk assessment was conducted, and it stated that Damien using drugs and alcohol would increase his risk of causing serious harm. By August of 2021, he disclosed that he was using weed and alcohol to his probation officer. After learning this information, the probation officer reached out to Children's Services to see if he needed to make a referral based on Damien's drug and alcohol use, but no formal recommendation or referral was made. I guess this probation officer assessed that he was actually low risk of committing harm to others while on drugs based on his own information. I don't know how that determination was made, completely disregarding the other risk assessment. But either way, this issue of his drug use was never raised to a manager or anybody else on that parole board. Now, during that time of his sentence, again, he was supposed to be doing that unpaid work, going to alcohol treatment meetings and all of that. However, he wasn't doing almost any of this. He did go to a few appointments for his alcohol treatment initially, but after four appointments, he stopped going and continued not going even after getting warnings. This was never fully followed up on or strictly enforced. He also never started his work hours. Again, his sentence specifically also stated that he was not allowed to use drugs or alcohol, but that was not enforced either as we see, because again, he was openly admitting to it, but it was never raised to the parole board. Then according to one source, while Damien was being fitted for an electronic monitoring system, Damien made an offhand comment to an employee there that he would kill his girlfriend and her children if their relationship ever went bad. Yet still, this comment was never reported. So even through all of his crimes, him clearly having no regard for his parole, him not following any of the rules, he was still just allowed to go about his life and do what he wanted. Now, going back to the day of the murders. As we heard from before, the girls were selling sweets to raise money for cancer research. Then they went home for a sleepover at around 8 p.m. Meanwhile, Terry and John were just hanging out around the house that day. They had went and run some errands. I believe John saw his dad that day, but by around that same time, everyone was home. At the same time, by around 7.45 p.m., phone records show that Damien was out buying and smoking weed. A short time after that, he returned to the home where he was texting and calling another drug dealer who sold cocaine. It's unclear whether he was using cocaine at that time or trying to get cocaine, but from what I read, it appears that he was using cocaine at the same time that he was texting this dealer. Again, as we know, the last known communication is from John when he tells his mother at around 9.40 p.m. that he's going to take a shower. It is some time after that when the attack took place. We don't have an exact time because again, neighbors didn't hear anything that could indicate anything was going on. But the fact that John was found in the bathroom and we know that he was about to take a shower at around 9.40 p.m., 
that tells me that the attack happened pretty quickly after this text was sent. That night, Damien went around the house attacking each victim one by one by hitting them in the head repeatedly with a claw hammer. It most likely started with John, who was in the bathroom. He then went to Terry in the master bedroom and beat her as she slept. He then went into the room where Connie and Lacey were sleeping and attacked them one by one with that hammer. Then, as if that attack wasn't enough, after hitting Lacey in the head with that hammer, as she lied there dying, he raped her in that room. Then, he picked her up and moved her to the master bedroom where he then raped her for a second time. At some point, he also used some sort of ligature to strangle her, so this, in addition to her head injuries, is what led to Lacey's death. Everyone else in the home died as a result of their severe head injuries. As if that wasn't bad enough, after the bodies were examined by the medical examiner, they found out that Terry was actually in the early stages of pregnancy. This was something that she had not yet told anyone. I mentioned earlier that she told a friend that she had good news and it's thought that the good news she was going to share was that she was pregnant. She never got the chance to tell that friend or anyone else of her pregnancy. After attacking and murdering four people in that home, at some point, Damien left the home, taking John's gaming council with him and gave it to a drug dealer in exchange for drugs. At some point, he then stabbed himself in the chest and stomach with some sort of butter knife, though these injuries were minor, only requiring stitches. He then spent the entire rest of the night with the bodies before calling his mom the next morning, over 10 hours later. After being reprimanded by police and admitting his involvement, he went in for questioning. And in that interview, he said that the whole house is covered in red wine. He admitted that he used the hammer. He then said that he didn't realize what he did until he walked into the room and saw his missus and his daughter. In that interview, he added, quote, Bet you don't usually get four murders in Kilimarsh, do you? Well, five murders, because my missus was having a baby. Absolutely disgusting and disgraceful. After this, as we know, Damien Bendel was charged with four counts of murder, then later charged with the rape after he admitted to it. Do you feel like this whole thing could have been prevented? Of course he could have. Yeah. She wasn't even consulted whether he was allowed to be bowed at her address. Um, was she just waiting for that one moment to say, no, this person ain't who I thought he was? But that never came, did it? So many people's lives were wrecked just because someone could do their job properly. At first, he tried pleading guilty to charges of manslaughter, claiming decreased capacity, saying that he was psychologically impaired since he was on drugs at the time of the killings. He also tried to claim that he had suffered traumatic brain injuries in his youth. However, the prosecution did not accept this defense, so he was set to stand trial. For some time, he was assessed by various mental health experts to see if he had any sort of argument but it was found that he had no mental impairment. So, after all other avenues were exhausted and he realized that he had no way to fight this, Damien did plead guilty to the four murders plus the rape of Lacey. In the sentencing phase, of course, everyone talked about just how horribly this crime has affected them. John Paul and Lacey's father, John, was absolutely crushed by this senseless crime. He said that he can't find a day where he isn't constantly thinking of how much his children suffered and how badly he wishes he could have prevented this. Terry's parents are very outspoken about how badly this has affected them. And of course, both Connie's parents are heartbroken as well. The biggest thing that just breaks my heart with Connie's murder is that she wasn't even supposed to be there that night. She wasn't supposed to be sleeping over that second day, but after both girls excitedly asked permission, it was granted. There was absolutely no way Connie's family could have known that any of this would happen, but I'm sure it made them feel absolutely helpless and devastated. Oh, gone, then. John Paul Bennett, described by his father today as his mini-me. Sharing these videos online, he called his daughter Lacey the apple of his eye. 
He came to the street where police had found them among four people dead in a house. He was broken, he said, and just wanted to kiss his babies. It was well mannered. They always remembered the manners. They always please and thank you. <laughs> if you ever brought him a present, the first thing they did was go on Facebook and they thank you. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to manage without him. <laughs> no. Connie had the ability to always make me smile. She was like my best friend. There are there are no words. I just, yeah, I'm I'm gonna miss my my baby girl. Connie was well one of the nicest girls you'll ever meet. I, I suppose uh, she was special. She could have been anything she wanted to be. I'd ra I'd rather it be me than her. Yeah, she got a whole life out of it. Since I found out, it it, it doesn't even feel real. I wake up every morning and and hope. Yeah, it's all been a, a bad nightmare, but yeah, yeah. The judge in this case also spoke about how disturbing of a crime this truly was. The judge stated, quote, The circumstances are truly hideous. Terry was in the early stages of pregnancy. It appears the defendant went around the house looking for them and attacking them in each turn. These were brutal, vicious, and cruel attacks on a defenseless woman and three young children. The defendant attacked them using a claw hammer, which he used to hit them over the head and on the upper body. It was perfectly clear that none of the victims stood a chance. Due to the horrific, violent nature of these attacks, Damien Bendel was handed a life sentence for the quadruple murders, which is very rare of a sentence to be handed in England. And to this day, there has never been a motive revealed or a real reason for why this happened. Now, I don't want to sit here and speculate too, too much, but my thoughts are that maybe this was all over drug money, seeing as how he sold John's gaming council right after the murder so that he could buy more drugs. Or I can say that this was in a frenzy because of the drugs he took and the fact that he said that he didn't realize what he did until later. We also know by his past behaviors that he becomes a lot more violent when he's on drugs. But the other thing I think of is that report we heard about earlier where there was this concern over Damien showing sexual violence towards girls. Was there some incident we didn't know about? Where did this report come from? But no matter where that report came from, it makes me wonder, was he possibly abusing Lacey this entire time, but it was just never reported so we don't know to this day? We know that he raped her two times after her murder. So it does make me think that something else could have been going on and Terry either knew about it and didn't report it because she was too afraid or Lacey was so terrified that she never said anything and she died with that secret. Maybe at some point she threatened to tell and that is why this all happened. We truly don't know what caused this, but I do think that those reports earlier of him being at risk for sexual harms to girls, it makes me think that maybe he said something in passing and, you know, maybe something happened in his past, something like that, that made officers feel a little bit sketched out by him and... Because of that, again, it's totally possible that he had been abusing Lacey this entire time and that's why all of this happened. Those are the three main things that I think could have been the cause of this, but again, we truly don't know why this happened. It could have been any of those things. It could have been none of those things. It could be for a reason that we don't know about. And at this point, I don't know if we will ever know because I don't think Damien will ever tell us. All I can say is that this man is clearly a monster. He clearly has no regard for anybody else and is willing to do whatever he felt was necessary to get what he wanted. He is right where he belongs and I certainly hope he never sees the light of day again and I hope he's suffering every single day. Of course, after these horrific murders, there was an inquest done to see how exactly Damien's case was handled. Of course, as I outlined before, they found those several instances where his parole officers failed to follow up on complaints and information that was concerning. According to the inquest, it was found that both of the parole officers overseeing Damien's case were trainees who lacked the experience to know how to handle these situations, which explains why so many things weren't reported, why so many things weren't followed up on. All of these missteps led to Damien being allowed to live with a woman and her children when he absolutely never should have been. All we can do is hope, as I say in so many of these types of videos, is that these missteps can be a teaching moment to others who work in the same area. 
Hopefully this can cause positive change that can prevent this from happening to anybody else. Obviously, this was such a tragic and senseless crime. One adult and three children lost their lives for absolutely no reason because of a man who never should have been allowed to live with them to begin with. My heart absolutely goes out to the families of Terry, Lacey, and John, and Connie. They all have to live with this heartache every single day, and I know not a day passes where they don't think of these lives lost far too soon. To me, I just hope that this monster responsible is suffering every single day that he spends in prison. But that is all I have for today's video. I know that it was such a devastating case, but I do want to know what you all think of this case. Why do you think this happened? Do you think it was some drug-fueled frenzy, or was this over drug money? Do you think this had something to do with him possibly abusing Lacey? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy and I hope to see you next time. Bye.